Now, if we were to associate a street sign with a chemical reaction, you might think of this one. But in truth, it's probably more accurate to think of many chemical reactions like this. That's right, most chemical reactions proceed in both directions, or at least they show a tendency to proceed in both directions. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that they are like this, and that's because, for the most part, when we take a look at chemical reactions, we only start with reactants. That is, there are no products to collide and reform those reactants. Also, this sign might give us a little bit of indication as well. A lot of reactions, especially things like combustion reactions or rusting oxidation reactions, aren't energetically favorable in that reverse direction. But if we can create a closed system, one at which we don't allow any more reactants in, and we don't allow any product out. And we don't allow any changes in the conditions of that system, such as changes in temperature, changes in pressure. Eventually, what we're going to observe is a point at which the rate of reactants forming products, that is the rate of the forward reaction, and the rate of the products forming reactants, that is the rate of the reverse reaction, those two rates are equal. And what we would observe is, well, nothing. We would have achieved a steady state. And what that means is, the particles that are forming products and the particles that are products forming reactants, they're effectively doing so at the same rate. So from a macroscopic level, we don't see any changes. This is the steady state. But if we were to take a look down at the particle level, we would continue to see reactants forming products and products forming reactants. That is, it's a dynamic steady state. And more than that, because our rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse, we've achieved something called chemical equilibrium. Now this can be visualized maybe a little bit easier using a graph. And we can see at time zero in this graph that we have a relatively high concentration of reactants and a relatively low concentration or no concentration of products. And initially these reaction rates are going to be fairly quick, so the slope of these lines is going to be fairly steep. But as reactants start to form products and as products start to form reactants, we can see that these slopes decrease. And eventually we are going to achieve a point at which the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse. Now, remember with this diagram, if we take a look at the slope of the line, it's going to be the change in concentration per unit time. That is effectively rate. So if we take a look at this, when these two rates are equal, we have achieved a point at which we can see on this graph equilibrium. So now that we understand that chemical reactions can proceed in both directions, when we analyze an equilibrium system like this, we're going to remove the unidirectional arrow and replace it with this to indicate that the reaction that we're analyzing is an equilibrium system. And since we understand that the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, we can then derive a value for this that we call the equilibrium constant. And the way that we derive this is by taking the concentration of the products raising it to the appropriate exponent represented by the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation, over the concentration of the reactants, again, raising any of the reactants to the exponent from the coefficient of the balanced chemical equation. And in doing so, if we know the concentrations at equilibrium, we can then utilize those concentrations to establish the uh, equilibrium constant for that reaction under those conditions. Now, partly because it's derived from rate, and partly because it's an equilibrium system, we have to understand that these equilibrium constants are held only at a certain temperature. That is, if the temperature changes, so too does the value of K, or the equilibrium constant. Now remember, these square brackets refer to molar concentration. So as we're first learning this value, for the most part, we're only going to be analyzing systems where this molar concentration could potentially change. So that includes those substances that are gases and those substances that are in aqueous environments. Now there are instances in which we have a homogeneous equilibrium in which all of the reactants of products are in the same state, like the liquid state, where we can also use this but that comes along fairly rarely, and for the most part, we're only going to be dealing with gaseous equilibrium systems and systems that involve aqueous ions, at least for our initial analyses of the equilibrium constant itself. Now, I have little doubt that if you were to be given the equilibrium concentrations of all the reactants and products, and you understood how to derive the equilibrium expression from the equilibrium equation, that you could come up with a value for K. But so what? What, what does that actually tell us? 
Well, if we think about how the value of K is derived, it's derived from the concentration of products over the concentration of the reactants. That is, the value in the numerator divided by the value in the denominator. And if the value in the numerator is greater than the value in the denominator, then we are going to get a K that is greater than 1. And if the opposite is true, the value in the denominator is greater than the value in the numerator, then we're going to get a K of less than 1. So what that tells us then is that if we have a K that's greater than 1, at this particular temperature, the equilibrium concentrations of the products, the value in the numerator, are greater than the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants, the value in the denominator. That is, we say that it is product favored or that it lies to the right. If, on the other hand, we saw that we had a value of K that was less than 1, that means that at equilibrium, at that particular temperature, the concentration of the reactants is greater than the concentration of the products, and we say that the reaction is reactant-favored, or lies to the left. So the equilibrium constant tells us, for that particular reaction, at that particular temperature, which way is favored. Are we going to see more reactants at that particular temperature, or are we going to see more products at that particular temperature once equilibrium is established? So hopefully this video has introduced you to the idea that, well, not all chemical reactions are moving down a one-way street. Sure, reactants form products, but products can also form reactants. In fact, under certain conditions, we can achieve what we call a dynamic chemical equilibrium. And this chemical equilibrium can be analyzed using its equilibrium constant, which is derived from its equilibrium expression. Now, since not all chemical reactions are going to be at equilibrium right away, we have to be able to utilize this equilibrium constant in some way, shape, or form to help us figure out how a system is going to achieve equilibrium or what the equilibrium concentrations are going to be so that we can analyze once the system has achieved equilibrium. And of course, those are going to come in future videos. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching.